There we go. Hello. Can you guys hear me okay? Is it projecting? Yeah, it's good. All the way back to great. So um, who am I? Steve Vitito handles Bool 101. You can be my like fifth follower on Twitter if you so desire. Uh, I work for a company called uh, Endgame. Uh, Endgame builds security systems for commercial and government use. And uh, the whole reason why I'm giving this talk and I've been blogging about CTF recently is uh, that we're offering CTF training uh, that we can bring into a company and like run you through the whole experience, take a week to build a problem for you, run you through you know, how you would defend this problem, how you would attack it, and then have a head-to-head -head competition uh, that's a personal and private thing. Uh, it turns out a lot of people don't want company names associated with hacker uh, ca capture the flag competitions for some reason. Uh, so I've been doing this sort of thing for about uh, six years. I started at uh, DEF CON 16 with the School of Root team and then went on to start my own team called Samurai that won at DEF CON 20. Um, I've got a you know, black badge and all that good stuff. And we're actually running a CTF during this talk right now. So if you have a laptop, uh, I've built a, like an intro CTF 101 for you. And there's a link down there at the bottom, ctf.mur.ai. And uh, there's three simple challenges. It'll take you maybe 10 to 30 minutes each, depending upon how familiar, familiar you are with some of these things. And uh, you can play as part of a team, you can play solo. Uh, but if, if you get bored of hearing me speak, go do a challenge. And there's prizes involved. So No Starch Press was kind enough to put up five books for grabs. And uh, the top five people with the, the highest scores and the soonest submit time will take home the book of their choice. Um, so submission is done by email to me, and I'll sort it all in the Capture the Flag room here after the talk. That said, there is a Capture the Flag like proper event happening at this conference, and I would encourage you to participate in that as well. Um, so any questions on that? There will be some, some hints coming up um, throughout the talk, so if you get stuck on a problem, you can wait for a hint or look at a different problem. Uh, I like to run things very informally, so if you have a question while I'm speaking, we have a really small group. If you just raise your hand and uh, get my attention, and I'll answer it right away. We don't need to wait till the end. There are these um, red coupons that I was asked to tell you about as well. These, these are special coupons that will give you swag at the end, and they go to people that ask really good questions. So if you have a good question, uh, I will give you one of these right away. Yeah, go ahead. No. <laughs> I could try, though. Uh, so the basics of Capture the Flag. So most of the Capture the Flag games that you're going to see out there are the Jeopardy-style Capture the Flag. And you can see there's a screenshot of a scoreboard from, I think that's DEF CON 20. Uh, you've got a point value assigned to a problem, and every problem is in a category. So like networking would have a 100, 200, 300, et cetera, point problem. Uh, there's usually a leading problem in these games that is the first one open, the first team to solve that problem, then gets to pick the next problem. And sometimes there's breakthrough points. So if you are the fastest team or person to solve a problem, you get an extra three points per problem. Uh, and these aren't always associated with security conferences. Like usually you'll hear, oh, the DEF CON capture the flag or the hack in the box capture the flag. No, as a matter of fact, there's been about 15 this year and they run about every other week. And there's not that many security conferences running. So people run these uh, just for fun as a group. And you can, uh, you can find a list of them online and uh, sign up. You don't have to be anywhere to do these. These are all, these are all completely on the internet. Um, and usually, usually they're web-based kind of scoring systems. Sometimes you see more creative things that I'll talk about in a little bit. The other major style of capture the flag events is an attack defense style. Uh, these are the kind of events where you show up, uh, usually to a conference, and you you sit down at a table with you know seven or eight other guys, and they get an Ethernet cable, and that's that's the start of it. That's all you get, and um, on the other end of that Ethernet cable is a server that you have to defend. And the server is running custom services that have been written by the organizers. So the goal is to pull back those custom services, uh, reverse engineer them to the point that you understand them, figure out how you can defend them from other people attacking them, and then attack everyone else that's on the same network as you. So this brings in a lot of different elements that kind of overlap and uh, really create a really fast-paced and fun game. This is what the DEF CON final CTF is that runs every year. Uh, and this is, um, it's interesting that you qualify for the, the attack defense CTF through a Jeopardy CTF, so you have to display skills in, in all areas of it. The rules are different for these every time, though, so it's not like you capture a flag off a box, and maybe I should mention what a flag is. So uh, if you're running a service, say you're running you know, service one on your box, 
there's going to be a file on that box called flag that's owned by service one. Someone has to exploit that service, gain control of the service one user to be able to read that flag. And then they submit it through a scoring system associated with their team login and they get a point. They don't always work that way. Sometimes it's zero sum game where you're given a flag and then can, someone can take it away from you. Or you score a flag from someone else and you can lose that flag. Again, that's how the last um, three DEF CONs have been. They've been all zero sum scoring, which uh, places a much higher emphasis on defense. Because it doesn't matter how good your offense is, is if all of your flags are leaking out of your box after you score them. So this is my personal favorite CTF, style of CTF, because uh, it really encourages creative thinking. There are two others other than DEF CON that I'm aware of, probably more. The two other big ones are uh, the ICTF run by uh, UCSB uh, that is available to academic teams, and then the RU CTF, which is a Russian CTF. But you had to give them like network access to your box, and I wasn't so cool with that. Uh, the other the other styles that you'll see are like hybrid kind of CTF. So you'll have like Hacker Halo, uh, where you know you're, you have a team playing Halo and you have a team hacking. And you know if the team hacking does really good, the Halo team will get some benefits. Or if the Halo team does really good, the hacking team will you know disable DEP on a binary or something like that. Um, these are these are almost always associated with conf conferences because they require physical presence, uh, and that enables you to do things like physical security. So there have been CTFs where you have to pick a lock to show physical security prowess, then you have to social engineer your way into a building uh, to get a network tap before you can enumerate their network to find the challenges. So these get really, really inventive and they scale the whole OSI model of you know, threats. You'll also find that people really go over the top with the gamesmanship of these. So there have been CTFs that are uh, you know, based after global thermal nuclear war from the movie War Games, right? Where you are attacking a SCADA system to launch nuclear missiles at the other teams. And, you know, if you lose a missile or you get hit with another missile, um, your points are based upon those kind of calculations. And then other people have seen the value of, um, of these kind of competitions in the government as well. So you have the cyber defensive exercise, which is where you get uh, MIT, um, or not, there's another one with MIT, you get like West Point, uh, the Naval Postgraduate School, uh, the Merchant Marines, uh, different big sectors of the government defending against the NSA Red Team attacking networks. So the CD ex exercises are kind of their own unique thing. You have policy to adhere to. You've got a big network to defend. It's not like one custom binary. And these are usually um, not custom services. You're going to be running you know, a vulnerable version of Internet Explorer, and then you have to defend the attackers once they get in. And there's a whole big debate raging online about if these are a value for anyone other than the red team or not. Um, I think that they are. I think that the red team benefits more, but uh, there's definitely value in trying to defend a large-scale network and write you know, proper reports and go through all the procedures, especially in a military or large corporate network. So why should you personally play CTF? Uh, most of all because it's a lot of fun. You're going to come into a lot of interesting things. Um, my favorite one so far is from the Ghost in the Shell code this year, actually. Um, these guys, I, I don't know how many hours they put into this, but they wrote an entire, uh, basically a World of Warcraft clone uh, that you, you'd log in, you'd create a character, you'd get a sword, and then the idea was you had to hack the game. So you could change the value of gravity and jump to the moon, and then you know, that, you'd have to modify the binary on, the, on your own system to change the value of gravity. And once you got to the moon, you could get a flag from a chest in the moon. And that was all, you know, they, they did a pretty good job segmenting the client and server communications as well. And this was all, you know, j just, just for fun. About half of the, half of the challenges came from, from the game alone. Um, with the more advanced CTS, especially the reverse engineering, you find things like custom operating systems. People have written from the ground up. And those custom operating systems are running on a custom architecture. And then, you know, they're running an emulator for their architecture and their operating system. And, um, you know, these, these are not usually vulnerable challenges. These are, send me a program and I'll run it. So you have to reverse engineer the architecture, byte code of the instructions, understand what they do, understand how the operating system processes files, send them code that you've, you know, hand jammed with a, a you know, hex, or like Python or a hex uh, editor, and get, use that to retrieve a flag. So the sky's really the limit, and um, every, every, every CTF, I see something that surprises me that hasn't been done before. Uh, the last one um, we played in was SecU Inside CTF, and they had a, uh, a, a, a it was a JavaScript jail. So you have like um, sandboxes for Flash, you have sandboxes for Python that's been done before in CTFs. This one they took V8, and um, you had to exploit V8 in order to gain the flag. So this is like a real world exploit, and if you were 
you know, six months earlier, you would have been writing a zero-day exploit for V8. Thankfully, they used a slightly vulnerable version. So the whole point of all of this is that you get a real big breadth of experience. And um, you, learn, you learn about technology that's new. So you get new, um, new operating systems, new uh, JavaScript interpreters, and you get technology that's very old. So DEF CON qualifiers this year had a 16-bit DOS simulator that you had to exploit, and that was one of the hardest problems in the game. Uh, mainly because we didn't, we only had one guy on the team that had been doing security long enough to ever interact with 16-bit programs, right? So you have to go back and learn uh, how did that segment register work here, and it actually ended up you could overflow one of the code segment registers, so you'd point back to a different section of code. It was a really, really interesting problem. But now we we've all gained the knowledge of, you know, how that technology used to work, and you can apply that to new technology going forward. Um, so you, you fill in all these skills gaps as well. There was, um, there was one problem in particular, so I, I'm going to talk a lot about CTF problems that I've you know, seen or solved. There was one problem in particular a couple years ago that was um, e-flags corruption. So this function would come up, they would push the e-flags register, they'd do something, there was an off by one error in string parsing of the function, and it would corrupt one byte of e-flags. And I'm like, well, okay, that's kind of useless. E-flags is what's used to, you know, check a comparison. So you always do like compare this value to whatever you want to go, whatever you want to look at, and then jump based upon it. And the compare will reset e-flags. Um, so you're like, well, that's kind of kind of worthless. Until you bring up the architecture manual and you look at e-flags and you see that there's one bit in that register that says controls the direction of string parsing so that when you're writing a string on the stack, instead of going down, you can flip this bit in e-flags and go up. And that would allow a stack overflow to corrupt the previous stack frame of, you know, where there was no vulnerability in that, in any of the other bits of the program. So you find these almost new attack vectors, new attack classes that you wouldn't see uh, in anywhere but a CTF, except for a very rare instance. And then you can audit for things like this, right? So you're not just tracking input, you're tracking, are they doing anything weird with e-flags that I could maybe affect? And this is really a team sport. I don't, I don't know how sporty it is, but it's a team event, and you gain a lot from, from just that by itself. So you, you gain friends, professional contacts. Uh, the last three job offers I've had have all come from CTF contacts. Uh, and then you get to, to learn and teach your peers as well. Um, the one thing that, um, yeah, I, I haven't done pen testing for a while, but the one thing that I've heard people say about, about these kind of events are that uh, you go beyond pen testing. It's not you're not social engineering your way in, you're not throwing MS-08, 067, and then stealing credentials and propagating. You're actually hacking a binary to, to gain information back. So this is real, true, live offense. And if you're going to go about discovering and, and you know, writing exploits for zero-day bugs, this is the best way in the world to get practice for it. And it's free. You don't have to pay a thing to do this. Uh, all it costs you is some time and a little bit of willingness to fail, which I think is a big part of uh, what goes into determining how successful you are at these things is if you are tolerant to failure. And that, that skill applies in you know, a lot of different areas of life. So Samurai is kind of a big team. We have about, I think, 160 people that we've ever been associated with. We have about 40 active members. And uh, at our peak, we hit about 80 members. Uh, and a lot of them don't play, right? So they, they don't have the time to do it. They, um, they're, they're new, they don't feel like they'd be able to solve some of these more difficult problems. Uh, and they, they feel like they just wouldn't be able to contribute to a team. Um, bullshit, right? No, that, that's your excuse is getting in the way of something you want to do. Uh, so we've compromised a lot with people. You know, they show up, they do one problem, and, you know, they, they provide the right idea at the right time sometimes. Sometimes they don't do anything, but uh, they, they, put, they get out of it what they put into it. And if you put in just a little bit, I think you get a lot out in return. Um, and a lot of people, like, are afraid of being a noob. Uh, and I don't know if this comes from video gaming or whatever. You don't get that in the CTF community. No one's going to laugh at you for being a newbie playing CTF. Everyone started there at some point. And um, you may have to ask some questions, and people may explain things to you in a rushed manner because they're trying to solve a, a different problem. But you will get an answer. Uh, so for those of you that are um, looking at the Capture the Flag challenge that I uh, put up earlier, ctf.mur.ai, uh, the first one, uh, the methods of encoding should be fairly straightforward. Um, you know, you can see binary values, you should decode those. Um, the one that might trip you up after you decode, I think it's three times, uh, is a compression format. And uh, I'll leave it to you to figure out which compression format is used. So um, I wanted to 
talk a little bit about the history of CTF and how we got to where we are today, uh, where we're coming from with it. So the, the first one that I could find was um, at DEF CON. It's, it's either the oldest or one of the oldest CTFs. It was at DEF CON 4. So DEF CON 1, 2, and 3, they never had a, a capture the flag. And it wasn't until 1996 that this actually first became a thing. And it was uh, a contest that was run by the DEF CON goons. And, um, you would show up and they would give you something to hack and then there was, there was no scoreboard, there was no login, you didn't have to qualify. And you just, you'd just show them how you hacked it and then you'd get points that were kind of arbitrarily decided based upon style. So um, the last three of those six years, uh, this group called the Ghetto Hackers um, just dominated this competition. They won every year, every, every one of those three years. And uh, because they displayed that dominance, they were invited to run the game for the next three years. So from 2002 to 2004, Ghetto Hackers um, sort of took it and made it what it is today. They had um, ideas that you know haven't survived through modern CTF, but they have formalized a scoring system, they introduced qualification rounds, um, all of these things that you know came from their inspiration. And then the Kinshoto group took over after that. Um, they had a lot of style. If you ever, uh, so some of you may have been to DEF CON when they were, Kinshota was running the game. They had, um, they were the ones that started the big videos on the wall to add a whole psyops uh, theme to the um, capture the flag, so that the teams would be distracted while trying to hack. Um, after that, DD Tech, which was actually the School of Root team, took over from 2009 to 2012. And it's currently being run by the legit BS team, which some of those members came from the samurai team. So it's it's actually kind of a small community. I would say that once you get to the the levels where you're playing an attack defense competition at DEF CON, you've got probably maybe 300 people that are that are doing that. Uh, but there are thousands of people that play CTF overall. Right. So we already talked about this. Uh, one of the guys that's been doing this the longest is, his name is Chris Eagle. He wrote a, um, I had a pro book. He's been around for um, uh, probably 25 years in the community. And so I, I sat down with an interview uh, with him real, over email and uh, asked him to describe his first capture the flag experience to me. And uh, he said, you know, there, there was no qualifier. There was exactly, um, you know, you'd sh show up at the conference, you'd sit down at a table, and that uh, you'd reach into a box that had CDs on it, had CDs in it. You'd pull out a CD, and on your CD was going to be some sort of task. It was going to be a service that you would, you would have to defend. And um, you'd run that on whatever you wanted. You could run it on Windows, run it on Linux, run it on you know, your custom emulator. Whatever you, whatever you had available, you'd run it on. You'd show the, um, the organizers that you had it running, and then you'd get points based upon how long you were able to keep it up as long as you were joined to this network at the same time. And so everyone is, you know, trying to crash your service. It was mo more of a denial of service event than um, uh, a proper, like, exploit the binary, capture the flag. Today, uh, we have almost all custom services. We're not going after denial of service. We're going after custom exploits for these services. And we, we're, I think we're starting to walk this fine line between what's actually possible in a 48 or 36 hour time and, and what's actually just barely doable. And you find some of these challenges with, you know, one or two teams in the world that have solved them in that time frame. And that's actually, you know, pushing the envelope pretty, uh, pretty far. You get these, um, and today you're seeing a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot more weird and innovative ideas. So we had, um, had one problem that was a mixed mode binary. And this one, it was called Byte Sexual. It was, uh, they always have uh, cool names to them. Uh, this one would do a far call. So it would um, basically, no, normally when you do a call, you take, four bytes for your address on a 32-bit architecture. And then they would um, do a far call, which takes two, two bytes after the address to set your code segment register as well. So this binary would switch between 64-bit mode code segments and 32-bit code uh, mode code segments. And then it would jump in between them. So the code you analyzed as 64-bit becomes 32-bit, the same, the same bytes in the binary. And, it, and you, had, you had to like wrap your head around it and um, this is not something that's supported by, you know, any of the disassembling tools out there. You had to go through with Ida and usually comment, you know, what the 32-bit value was, what the 64-bit value was. And you could do it, but only two teams at the game solved it. So that's one of these problems that's, uh, you know, for the time frame, uh, balancing, uh, you know, impossible and barely doable. 
Most of the CTFs, be them attack and defense or Jeopardy, generally fall in these categories. So we've got binary reverse engineering, you know, binary exploitation, network analysis, ACM style programming. ACM is like a big programming uh, contest where you're given a task and you have to write a program to solve it. Uh, cryptography, forensics, and then web exploitation. Um, I have a friend that I promised I would, I would try to spread this term for him, but he, he thinks we should all call reverse engineering revenging. Uh, <laughs> I kind of like it, so I put it in the talk for him. So we'll call it revenging. Uh, and it's not necessarily all um, binary RE either. Uh, you find a lot of like um, source code that's been mangled, or you're missing chunks of um, files that are otherwise easy to RE. Uh, one particular one that sticks out in my mind is this uh, Minecraft game. Uh, and you, you log in and you pull up this world and you see that it's a circuit. So they've built a hardware circuit in Minecraft that you can actually interact with. You can flip the gates and get the right answer at the end. And the, the, the goal was to unlock a door by flipping the right gate. So you had to go through and hardware reverse engineer in Minecraft the whole thing. And then once you could get into the door, the flag would be displayed to you. So really, really interesting ideas. Most of them, though, are these sort of crack me programs, you know, where you're you're given a binary, it takes some input from a file or from a keyboard, runs through a really complex algorithm, and then says you win. So where's the flag, right? The flag is your input. So um, it's like a serial crack me. You, know, you, have to, you have to reverse engineer the algorithm to the point that you can provide the right serial number to get the program to print you win. And then you submit the serial number for points usually. Um, the latest innovations here have been really exciting. The uh, SAT Solver Z3, if you've ever used that. You can, you can write your um, reverse engineered code in a SAT solver and say, what's the answer to this? And it will churn for a little while and it will say, you need to have these conditions to make this uh, equation come out in the right way at the end. You also find patch me programs under the reverse engineering category. These are programs that have like key expansions. So there was one uh, recently that took up 100 uh, terabytes of memory to, to actually compute a, uh, a, a challenge, and you know that's that's just impossible. So um, you'd have to go through and figure out how it works. Figure out that oh, you don't actually need 100 terabytes to do this computation. In fact, you could optimize the memory speed trade-off this way, and then you write a little program that solves it in you know 15 minutes or so. So uh, one easy trick that you see a lot of organizers doing is to increase the difficulty of some of these problems is to just compile them to a different architecture, right? So GCC is an amazing tool. It'll you know, emit ARM, it'll emit PowerPC, uh, and you just have to pick a different one from your C code to make things exponentially more difficult in the amount of time allowed. So IDA Pro is really the, the big tool that people use here. Uh, if, you, uh, if you have never used IDA Pro and you want to get into reverse engineering, um, there is actually a free version available, and if you're a student, there's a student version available. And it's uh, it's actually relatively cheap to pick up. There's a competitor now that runs on um, OSX called Hopper, as well. That um, its big main feature and why people started using it over IDA was it provided x64 decompilation, so you could take an x64 binary and go right to C code. Uh, IDA Pro as a 6.6 now provides the same capability. Here's uh, three books here. Um, that you should read if you are brand new to reverse engineering. I would start uh, at the top and go down. Uh, yeah, question. Yeah, we'll put the slides up below. Uh, and then uh, the last thing you can do is experimentation. So if you if you take you know just a blank project in Visual Studio or you know Eclipse or whatever you want, take a C program and uh, compile it with the Stack Overflow in it. You know, stir copy from argv1 into some fixed size buffer, right? So this is like the classic example. And then uh, look at how that looks in the disassembly code. Then compile it with stack canaries on and see, okay, this bit changed uh, at the beginning of the function and the end of the function when I enabled stack canaries. So what you're doing is you're training yourself to recognize patterns in reverse engineering code. And really, this is a lot of what it is, is pattern matching. So if you, can, if you can write your own code that you know how it works because you wrote it, compile it, and then learn the binary patterns, uh, it's a really, really quick way to learn reverse engineering quickly. Uh, for those of you doing the CTF, um, the second challenge, I, I apologize a little bit, is kind of annoying. You get a little uh, QR code spat back to you, but it's in ASCII, so you have to find a way to read that. And it is actually possible to read it with your phone, um, 
And if you try changing fonts and sizes and zoom levels, um, you'll hopefully be able to get it. Uh, otherwise, you can write a program that will manually decode it and it will take you longer than the time of this talk. Okay, so binary exploitation. It, binary exploitation is what I view as sort of the next level of reverse engineering. It's not only understanding the program, it's understanding its weaknesses and how to take advantage of the weaknesses. So the better you are at reverse engineering, the better you are, are uh, the better you are going to be writing exploits. Um, the goal is uh, usually first to identify the exploit and then and then to exploit, right? So you can't you can't write an exploit for something you don't understand usually. Uh, th that's not always true. Usually, usually with these programs, you, you want to get shellcode execution. You want to pop a shell on a box or uh, read a flag back. And for these kind of problems, I spend more time with a debugger than I do Ida Pro. So I spend more time testing input and you know, figuring out what happens um, empirically rather than you know what I think will happen in Ida Pro. And people that are better reverse engineers than me do exactly the opposite. They spend the whole time in Ida Pro and then at the end, they type the input that gives them the exploit, and they don't debug at all, uh, which is really advantageous when you're on an architecture like, uh, say, PowerPC, and you don't have a good debugging story for that. Uh, but with CTFs, the fastest route always wins. So it doesn't matter how clean, how dirty it is, the fastest one wins. Um, there are a few patterns that are pretty easy to spot from the disassembly level. Uh, and I would encourage you to uh, write a program that's vulnerable to stack overflow, write a program that's vulnerable to heap overflow, look at format string bugs, look at integer overflows and underflows. These are easy things to write and see, and again, you compile them, you reverse engineer them, and then you learn not only you know, how the compiler works, but you learn those patterns for vulnerabilities as well. And then these are just things you can search for in other programs that are online. I also suggest that you try writing an exploit for each one of these. So write an integer overflow that leads to heap explo exploitation. What are your challenges there? Um, what if you're writing four gigabytes of data? How can you how can you make that function? And there's been other examples that have had corner cases that allow the impossible to suddenly become exploitable. Uh, a lot of the details for these are in um, CTF write-ups, and uh, you should you should definitely read CTF write-ups. And if you're doing some of this on your own, you should write your own because you will oftentimes find a different solution that wasn't in the proposed write-up. Uh, there's some more book recommendations here. Um, I do have a blog post with all these uh, book recommendations from Endgame. If you just do Endgame, getting started with CTF, all the book recommendations in this talk are uh, online with Amazon links as well. Um, I would read these in, in the same order presented here. Uh, I should mention that um, as CTFs get harder, new exploit mitigation technologies start getting introduced to the game. So at DEF CON 20, there was no DEF, there was no ASLR in the game. And DEF CON 21, not only was it ARM-based, but it was all DEF and ASLR enabled. So um, that's an, another way of making things harder, right? We have, we have these technologies, introduce them to the game, and now you're having to, you know, not just gain control of EIP, but you have to gain control of ESP, and you have to be able to read data from the program first. So you introduce these extra requirements for exploitation. Network analysis is one of these um, topics that really, I think, has a big impact in attack defense games. You do see it in the um, you know, Jeopardy style, but it has such a big advantage in attack defense games because all of these communications are not encrypted. So when people are talking to your binaries, it's in the clear. So if you see someone exploit your service and you can detect it, you just replay it to everyone else. Right, so then teams are, okay, I can't throw against that team because they have really good network analysis. And you see this in the CTF scoring is that they're making intelligent decisions about who they attack and when uh, with their uh, zero-day exploits. They don't want to give them away. Uh, so if you can automate a lot of that, it goes a, a long way to helping your team. I think um, at DEF CON 21, we ended up pulling three of our exploits from the wire directly. And that was, you know, other teams solved them faster than us, exploited us with it, you know, and then we, we were able to say, yeah, we understand enough about this to know that that's an exploit happening, uh, but we didn't quite have this leak working yet, so we were able to accelerate the binary exploitation process given data from the network. Uh, and it's important to go beyond Wireshark when you're talking about some of these tools. Wireshark is a great analysis tool. It's also got a lot of zero-day vulnerabilities in it, so if you're going to run it, I would run it in a VM. Um, we built most of our stuff based upon custom web PCAP tools. For the ACM style programming, uh, basically this is 
code the solution as fast as possible. You have to do it in a scripting language if you're going to win it. Uh, be, the, be one of the top teams to solve it. Python seems to be the most popular, although we do have some um, people that do uh, Ruby as well. Uh, Chris Eagle insists on doing everything in C++. Uh, he's crazy. Um, some examples of these kind of problems are tic-tac-toe. Uh, so, you, you know, you're playing against a computer, you have to win the tic-tac-toe so many times. You have to develop a game algorithm to beat their, their implementation. Then we had, um, you know, 3D chess and one. The, there was one that was really interesting called zombie hunting. So you'd, um, you'd log in, you know, you just net cat to the service. You're like, there's a zombie 30 feet from your car and you have a rifle. And how, how, uh, how fast that rifle shoots is this? What angle do you have to shoot at? And, you know, that's the, the level one. Then the zombie starts moving and you have to be able to track and you have to kill so many zombies before you run out of ammo. So you have to think about the mathematical calculations that go into that. You have to program it. You have to parse it. Um, and, you know, it, it takes maybe four or five hours per problem like this. Um, and speed, speed matters, right? So it, it matters not only in your programming ability, but it matters in where you launch from. So we've had cases where we've been failing on a problem for an hour and a half and then took the same solution and ran it from a better connected box uh, that had, you know, more RAM, more cores, and, you know, solved it right away which is somewhat disheartening for people that, you know, wrote that program that didn't get to, did not get to pull back the flag. But um, you gotta, you got to account for speed across the board with these problems. Um, and then you do see this kind of thing in attack defense games as a way to provide a captcha. So this provides an, a mitigation to the network attack. So if you just pull an exploit off the wire, if you then have to connect and, you know, play a game of chess and win it before you can send your exploit code, that game of chess is going to be different every time. So it's, a, it's like a a bit of a game capture that you have to solve. Cryptography, um, I won't go into too much. It's a very broad topic. There are some books you can read. Uh, we find this a lot with um, web challenges. Uh, and a lot of it's very simple stuff. Like the easier problems, you get substitution ciphers, Caesar ciphers, that kind of thing. Um, the Coursera course is um, from Stanford. Um, and it's actually pretty good. It's, it's, you may want to go through it a couple times to get it all, but it's actually a worthwhile thing to do. And then uh, forensic, I said my least favorite topics for the end, cryptography and forensics. Um, you get disk images and you're basically making wild guesses, in my opinion. Uh, you also get stenography and images, like uh, a bitmap image where the least significant bit uh, reassembled uh, gives you uh, a gzip compressed file, right? And like, who, who comes up with this kind of thing? But um, people manage to solve it, and it's just by um, intuition and guess and check. So the more experience you get at doing these kind of things, the better you get at doing them. And I think, I think that you could actually take some of these things and implement the checks that um, you, know, you have for Stego and images, for example, uh, based upon how other CTF organizers have implemented them. Uh, the O and O hex editor is my chief tool here with these kind of problems. Uh, but for anything that's you know, even moderately advanced, a custom tool is, is almost always required in CTF. Web exploitation, um, we have a couple of guys on our team that are just phenomenal web exploitation people. And they, you know, they run their own company, this is their business, and they go, yep, there's a, a SQL injection here, it's a reflected SQL injection after I cross-site script the admin. And it's like, <laughs> how did you change that together in, in uh, an hour? Um, but again, we're seeing this get much more difficult as these kind of people are, are writing these challenges. Uh, most of them are still PHP and MySQL challenges. So if you understand PHP and MySQL, you'll probably do good at the web challenges in a CTF. And you, you do get everything. It's not just, it's not all SQL injection, right? You get cross-site scripting, you get file includes, um, and you even get crypto problems mixed in with, you know, a crypto challenge to get to a file include. Uh, these things become layered very quickly. So you have to understand, um, you know, step one, get get through the door. Step two, once you're in the door, exploit this box over here. And, you know, there's, um, there's always multiple steps through the whole problem. Uh, the biggest tip I can give you when you're looking at web challenges is to always, always look at the headers uh, coming back from the web server. Um, there have been mistakes made with headers, like you could X-forward something. Uh, there have been uh, entire key data uh, or flags coming back from the headers. Uh, that was an intended for one of the easier solutions. So always check the headers. And the, the most popular tools I use are curl and SQL map. Uh, the web application the hacker's handbook is uh, getting to be a bit dated, but still has a lot of really good information in it. If you are just starting out at CTF, uh, I want you to know that you are going to be completely overwhelmed. Uh, the first time I ever did it, I did not capture a single flag. 
Uh, and the second time I did it, I did not capture a single flag, all right? So you, you will fail at this. And it takes a lot of time and patience and uh, a bit of dedication to get good at it. And that's sort of the point, right, is that in order to get better, you have to challenge yourself. Um, so CTF is kind of a unique animal. There's nothing that's going to train you for it like doing it. So when people ask me, how do I get started in CTF, I say, do a CTF. And you know, you're not going to do well, but that's okay. Um, it's important, though, that you don't stop after the game ends if you want to get better at it. So um, all, of, all of the best players on the Samurai team, the buzzer goes off, and so long as they're not super exhausted, will continue to solve a problem. They will continue to work until they can capture the flag. Um, and then they'll usually do a write-up on it. And once they do the write-up, they'll read other people's write-ups on the same problem that they did a write-up on and say, oh, they have a different solution than me. I missed that in the binary. What could I do to recognize that next time? So they're constantly in this game of improving, improving their techniques to, um, to engage with the community a little bit. And uh, doing your own write-ups, I, I think, is really valuable because you, you get to help teach other people these things as well. Um, I'm going to give away some secrets now uh, <laughs> about CTF. And I debated on doing this, but I thought I thought I got to put in some dirty tricks. So um, half the fun is creative thinking. Once these work once with one group of organizers, they tend not to work again. Uh, so really, uh, especially in an attack defense CTF, you're doing battle with the organizers. And what are their weaknesses? What did they forget to protect themselves from? Uh, there was one problem in the DEF CON qualifications called No Name Yet, which was a, um, it was a web problem. And it had a file upload vulnerability. You could upload a PHP backdoor to like an image gallery, right? And everyone had a back, every player had a backdoor in this box. It was just the most disgusting thing in the world. Uh, we uploaded a um, simple file monitor so we could see what else was happening with the box. And we found a CGI script that was set UID that would, you know, you, the, the idea was to exploit the CGI script instead of the file include. Um, but other teams didn't go down that path. They said, okay, there's a CGI script, but I've got a shell on that box. All right, what else can I do with the shell? And they found that the, um, the user's home directory that controlled that CGI script was actually world writable, right? So why did that happen? We completely missed it. And all they did was add a backdoor into bash aliases that when anyone else solved the problem, popped a shell and, you know, pulled the flag back, they got it too. Which, uh, like, bravo to the, uh, it was Geohot that did that. That was a great, uh, great technique. I wish I'd thought of it first. Um, so uh, these kind of tricks are completely acceptable in the CTF community and, uh, and encouraged. Uh, you can also look at how flags are generated. When School of Root was playing, I think it was the qualification around in DEF CON 15, they were able to reverse engineer how all of the flags were generated. And so they had <laughs> complete access to submit all the flags without solving a single problem. So all of these things are, are usually fair game. Um, the other thing you can do is, especially with the Jeopardy style, where you have closed problems you're not supposed to access yet, look at how the names are generated. Is it some English name that you could probably guess, underscore like an MD5 hash, or is it just some English name you could probably guess? Uh, do they have DNS records? Uh, do, do reverse DNS scans. Um, Honey Traps is a fun one at uh, DEF CON CTF. We had, um, uh, so I, I should go back and say that School of Root is a, is, is a team affiliated with the university, so they had lots of people rotating in and out of the team. But they had, um, had one very attractive lady that was on the team and would go and sit down with the Russian teams and would you know, be very, very interested in everything they were doing and they would show her everything. And then the next day she came and sat down with the School of Root team. And they were like, oh, we got owned by the honey trap. So um, you, know, you, you get a lot of, <laughs> we gotta get a lot of information um, through social engineering, uh, which is also on the table for these kind of things. Um, back to a technical solution, uh, you find common patterns in a lot of these problems. So like a CTF problem that is working over a socket and not INAT-D will typically accept a connection, fork, and then you know, do processing. But what happens to the parent? What happens to the child, right? You should read the man pages on, on fork and permissions. Um, can you kill the parent from the child? Are, they owned by the, are the processes owned by the same user? Better yet, could you p-trace into the parent and um, accept connections on behalf of the service that other teams are connecting into? Uh, or is the server socket not even closed? Could you just accept every other connection from teams that are trying to exploit that service? This leads to very, very complicated shellcode very quickly. 
uh, but nonetheless, is a really devious trick to play during some of these games. And um, especially in the Jeopardy style CTFs, you often see that the, um, the parent process is not protected. And in challenge three of this uh, mini CTF, it is not protected. So uh, permissions matter, right? So when I say not protected, are you running your service as the CTF user, or like service three user, or are you running your service as root? Which one do you think would be most intuitive, right? You're like, well, we don't want to have people exploiting a root binary, so we'll run it as a CTF user. But then we have this whole ptrace and permissions problem. So, okay, we'll run it as root, but then we'll fork and drop permissions, right? That's, that's the appropriate solution. But did you really drop all the permissions? Did you do it appropriately? Did you close the server socket again? Um, so you, you introduce this whole new attack vector into the game as well. Uh, XINETD makes this a lot simpler. The last DEF CON was run entirely on XINETD. It managed all of that. Um, appropriately so that every service user is binned to their own user group and can still listen on things like privilege ports. Sometimes you'll have CTFs where you get a shell on a box and you know, you, you're given SSH credentials and that's, that's your only clue for the problem. So you have to look around and figure out what's there. Usually it's going to be a set UID binary, right? Um, and there are a lot of tricks once you get a shell on a box that you can play to make your life easier. So, you can disable US, uh, ASLR by making this stack unlimited. So ulimit-s dash dash unlimited, no more ASLR for you. Um, signals are, are really interesting to send to processes that can cause unintended behavior. And in fact, that's the point of some of the CTF problems is to send the right signal at the right time to cause the right kind of behavior in the problem. And that's a matter of reverse engineering to figure out how signals work. But signals aren't something that are going to be available on a remote style problem. So they're unique to these kind of, uh, you have a shell in the box problem. You can make almost anything fail. Uh, all the API calls that you see when you have a problem that's being attacked over a shell, um, everything needs to have a return check on it. Uh, like if you open a file and you limit your file descriptors in your shell with ulimit-n3, you know, standard n, out, and error. Uh, if you try to open another file, it would be file descriptor 4, that's going to fail. Um, as a matter of fact, I've seen real programs that, you know, give you a root shell on the box because of this problem. Um, the other things you could do, like maybe sniff traffic, if that's available, if you can sniff traffic to the other services. And then uh, monitor that temp directory because everyone likes to put uh, interesting exploits in their work in the temp directory with not appropriate permissions because you're all logging in as the same user. Uh, indeed, if we'd monitored the temp directory on that no name yet DEF CON problem, we would have been able to you know, pull the flag back without having to do any uh, actual program analysis. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting to talk about uh, Samurai Team a little bit. Uh, just given that we're uh, kind of a large team uh, with about 40 active members and we peaked at 80 during the DEF CON 20 finals. And we're distributed ge geographically. So we have people all over the U.S. We've got people in Canada and England. And we have two people in Australia. So, I mean, we're, we're everywhere that, um, that people live. And, they, you know, they're not all traveling for these events. So it introduces a lot of organizational challenges for us. So what we do is we have one central IRC server that everyone logs into. Uh, the games are actually managed by a custom IRC bot, so you can you know, add a problem, say you're working on a problem, uh, you can uh, solve a problem to let other people know to stop working on it, which is very important for optimizing how people spend their time. And then um, we have VoIP servers as well, so we can actually log in and, and talk about a problem, which is significantly faster than typing. Like the guys that play um, you know, World of Warcraft or any of these other MMORPGs, they're all in VoIP for a reason, right? It's a lot faster way to communicate. And the same applies to CTF. When we're actually uh, in, in a location, like for, um, for DEF CON, we will have dedicated support staff. So people will bring us food so we don't have to get up and <laughs> go get food. Um, we also had to employ physical security. So we would have, um, I think it was um, the European NOPS led team would send one of their guys over and like stand by your table and try to overhear and watch your screens. We'll have screen protectors. We had a bouncer that would say, you know, shoo. Um, and all, all of these were really essential to being successful at, at some of these events. And then, um, you know, since we're not all at a table, uh, you know, we've got two hotel rooms, a group in a different country, and, you know, a group at a table. We had local leaders for those individuals. We call them cells. So we had a, a cell leader for a hotel room, a cell leader for a table. And then those central points of contacts would um, communicate with one another to organize who was doing what. And uh, I'll leave you with uh, a real quick war story that um, came from DEF CON 20. We, we go into this uh, huge room. It's about, I don't know, twice, three times the size of this room. And every table had a printer on it. 
And we're like, oh no, this is going to be a CTF on printers, which uh, you know would be totally awesome, but would be a massive pain in the butt because none of us had really reverse engineered a printer before. Uh, so we immediately you know, get out the screwdrivers, pull these printers apart, pull the boards off of them, dump the firmware, uh, see the like cached faxes that were in, in memory, and then um, the organizers had to say, "Stop! Those aren't our printers." <laughs> They were, uh, they were leftovers from the World Series of Poker, and they just were toying with us by giving them an Ethernet connection and power on the tables. Um, what they did conceal, though, was an NFC tag. Uh, so you'd find this piece of paper with an NFC signal on it, and you could read it with a cell phone. Uh, we had one guy on our team that had a cell phone with an NFC reader. And um, beep, you know, you'd come back and you'd get a private key, like ours a private key. And it's like, all right, so we're going to get a private key. They're going to give us something encrypted. And uh, after we realized this, we looked around the room, and we see everyone else is still trying to put back their printers are still tearing them apart depending upon where they uh, stood on believing the organizers or not. And um, we were maybe the first or second team to figure that out. And then we realized that these are private keys that are wirelessly enabled. And so <laughs> we decided to go around to some of the other teams and see if we couldn't steal their keys. And uh, this one, uh, I, I kind of feel bad for picking on them. This one poor team um, had visa problems getting into the US called the Cybears. And uh, they were by a water cooler. I mean, it was just the perfect cover. And we sent a guy over to the water cooler. And another person reached into the printer and pulled out the NFC tag. We dumped their private key and then replaced it. We replaced it with hacked by hate's irony, which wasn't our team name at all, but we wanted to decoy it to someone else. And we slipped it back into the printer. And after about an hour and a half, we, we told the organizers that, you know, they're not being dumb. They're, they're, their key has been messed with. Uh, so they gave them, you know, appropriate credentials to get on the game. But we had, we had a lot of fun with it. And this ended up becoming really, really important uh, later on in that day when we got a copy of their encrypted data as well that we could now open with a key that we'd stolen earlier just from hijinks earlier. And that gave us full root access onto their box. So we scored every service all at once, um, which was a lot of fun because they played a uh, overkill or rampage you know, uh, sound in the CTF room that went on for about 15 minutes um, while we were solving every challenge. So CTF is a lot of fun. I would encourage all of you to play. Uh, if you've been playing the one um, that we've been running during this game, uh, I'll be next door in the um, CTF room here. And I encourage you to play the CTF here as well, and we'll, uh, we'll figure out who gets these, uh, these fine books from No Starch Press. Uh, so a big thank you to uh, my employer, Endgame, for uh, letting me come here on their dime. No Starch Press for donating the books. To Chris Eagle and Zach Riggle for giving me content and helping to support this talk. And to the Circle City Con organizers for setting this whole thing up. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I still have two tickets to give away for sweet swag. Yep. Absolutely. Yes. And there are a lot. So uh, there, there are actually academic competitions. And uh, you find that a lot of the teams are academic teams. And they run their own exclusive academic competition. So you have to be affiliated with the university, with a university email address to play. Um, I think it holds the same value academically or not academically, either, either way. But it should be pushed down further. These kind of, this way of learning, I think, is important to get people to teach themselves these topics. And you're seeing that with some of the high school CTFs now as well. So you've, you'll find like so and so high school won first place in their regional capture the flag competition, which but that didn't exist five years ago. That's, that's all very new. There's a lot of um, CTF for newbies. There's like uh, Pico CTF and Micro Corruption are, and uh, Seesaw are three of the uh, intro CTFs that are you know, targeting that sort of, sort of group. And if you get a ticket for that question, I like that. Yep, any others? Courtney, did you have any? Yep. Right, yeah, so defense is uh, dependent upon the rules. Um, in the past, uh, it had been something called SLA. Basically, the organizers would not only write a problem, but they'd write a program to interact with their, their service problem. And uh, if you failed to interact with it appropriately, you would, you would lose one point of SLA, which was just the raw percentage off your score. Um, more recently, the, uh, the SLA uh, rules have been changed. So last year, it was... If you scored down, all flags that you had associated with that service were distributed to other teams as if they had attacked it. So it was a huge defensive penalty if you, uh, if you could not keep your services up and running. Yep. 
and that's worth a second ticket. Any other questions, regardless of tickets? No, no prizes. Get the fuck off the stage. All right, thank you guys. Appreciate it.